I've just handed out the um, cover page for homework 14. That's going to be due on Friday, and then homework 13 is due on Monday, this coming Monday. Um, so the question was asked about the cover, pa uh, the um, equation sheet that you can bring to the final exam, and whether that should just be equations or other things as well. And um, I guess it's okay for it to be whatever you like. You can put anything you'd like on the front and back of a single letter sized paper. <laughs> Are there any other questions? What if it's not an equation? It's just equations, right? You can put anything you like on it. Anything you like. Yeah, that is put example problems, letters from your grandma, anything. <laughs> pictures of uh, a Ferrari. Is this in addition to Yeah, you can bring the equation, you know, the FE packet, or the, the equation packet that you'll be able to use on the FE exam. Bring that. And this equation sheet is in addition to that, because the FE equation packet doesn't have any of the numerical integration method equations. It doesn't have any of the equations you need for, um, it may have the Bellinger momentum equation, but there are several equations that we've used this semester that aren't on there. Will we get any laptops for it? Yes, definitely. All right. Well, uh, we're going to continue talking about the standard step method today, and you've already at least set up the structure of a spreadsheet for the standard step method, but I'd like us to get a little bit more practice. We'll probably spend about 20 minutes talking about uh, this next example problem, and then we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about a hydraulic structure that's known as a partial loom. Uh, any other questions related to these announcements? Now, just to review, the standard step method, rather than being a balance of specific energy, the standard step method is a balance of total energy. And so when we were comparing section one and section two, we were calculating the elevation above some vertical datum to the water surface. And so we called those WS1 and WS2. And the other big reminder here for the standard step method is that one and two don't mean the same thing that they always have, where we would always assume location one was upstream and location two is downstream. In the format of this uh, solution approach and the spreadsheet that was shown previously, location one is where you know something and location two is the unknown. And so what we're trying to find is some depth at location two that's going to give us an equality between the observed head loss and the calculated head loss. So with that very brief review in mind and the spreadsheet template that you developed last time, I'd like us to take a look at a location where we have a circular channel cross-section downstream. So the location one where we know things, we know that it's a half circle and that the depth downstream is 1.5 meters. Upstream, the section two, it is somehow transitioned gradually from the half circle to a triangle. And uh, at that upstream section, we don't know the depth. Um, you know the length between them. And what I'm just now recognizing is that I need to also tell you the channel slope between them. The channel slope. All right, this is uh, where Z1, you'll need to maybe write this down in the notes. Z1 is zero meters, meaning that at location one, the vertical data is at the channel invert. And Z2 is 0 0.5 meters. Okay, so with the delta Z and the length, that's the S0, the slope of the channel. The length between the two sections is 100 meters. And uh, that's the only other piece of information besides the coefficient of contraction C value that we're going to use is 0 0.2. And that factors into the process as well. So try and just to test the spreadsheet and your method that you've developed before, 
apply what you, the structure you've got with this new information, the new shapes. Of course, you're going to have to think for a little bit, what's the area of a half circle? What's the area of a triangle? And so on. So we're going to take 20 minutes to work through that. So we'll start with the stuff that we know at the uh, section one. Since it's a half circle, of course, the area is just going to be pi d squared divided by 2. Velocity is the flow rate divided by the area. Wetted perimeter is the uh, pi times the radius, which is the depth at that point. Hydraulic radius is the area divided by the wetted perimeter. Energy equation. Remember, since our last one was in terms of traditional units, G goes from 32.2. And now in this example, we're using SI units. And so we have to change G to 9.81. So we get the slope of the energy grade line at location 1. And it doesn't change regardless of how many iterations we do for section 2. All of this information stays known at section 1. By the way, uh, here in this example that we're working, we have an M1 profile because the critical depth is 0.65, the normal depth is 0.98. That tells us it's a mild slope. And at location 1, the depth is 1.5. And so that means that uh, it's a mild slope and the depth in the known section is in zone one. It's greater than the normal depth. So M1 profile means that upstream we're going to expect the depth to be shallower. That's the definition of an M1 profile. So when we get into the calculations for uh, the unknown section, you'll see I started with a depth of 1.5. There's nothing magical about that. I could have started with my depth of equal to 3, and it's still going to eventually converge at this 1.26 as the final answer. I wonder how bad my guess could be, and it would still converge at the correct depth. If I said my depth is 100, it, that's such a bad guess that it's not quite converged yet. It eventually would, but we can still be pretty terrible in our initial guess <clears throat> and get it to converge to where it ought to be. That can be, except for on the homework. And I've given you a hint on what you should start, what, what depth you should use as a beginning point on the homework. Because ordinarily, you can just assume it's the same as the section where it's known. But sometimes you won't actually, it won't numerically converge. Uh, you have to be a little bit smarter. And so in our case, we know it should be shallower upstream. So if I was going to be smarter, I'd say maybe 1.4. And that'll help it to converge faster. You know, the better my guess, the quicker it's going to converge. And, and Saying anything greater than 1.5 is actually the opposite of what I know from the water surface profile, because the water surface profile tells me with an M1, I should expect it to be getting shallower upstream. So, yeah. Now, this is a triangle, and so the area is just the depth squared. And I had to prove that to myself, you know, that since it's 2y across the top and a triangle is 1 half base times height, so it's 1 half y times 2y. So that's y squared, essentially. And velocity is the flow rate divided by the area. Wetted perimeter is uh, 2.828 times the depth hydraulic radius. So ultimately it converges to 1.26. Um, I'll let you keep working on it if you'd like, but really now what we need to do is turn our attention to partial flumes. This is a hydraulic structure that is um, pretty well known because of some efficiencies it's able to introduce. Um, remember that one of our criticisms of a broad crested weir was that a broad crested weir is great for measuring flow rates, but its weakness is that that upstream face of the broad crested weir tends to accumulate sediment 
for trash or debris so that um, over time as stuff accumulates here on the upstream face it's not really a weir anymore it, it, the sediment will just the channel will fill itself in and it just becomes a shallower channel rather than a broad crested weir and it works by inducing critical flow over the top of the broad crested weir so we remember the calculations from that um, a weir just in general is used to quantify flow rather than to control flow and uh, the broad crested weir introduces a contraction at the bottom of the channel well, a uh, partial flume, a partial flume is a kind of, a type of a flume. What it will do is it reduces the cross-sectional area so that it's a choke that's going to force critical flow. But instead of only contracting the bottom of the channel, there's also a contraction in the width of the channel. And that difference helps to avoid sediment and it reduces head loss. And so a flume uh, is a more gradual transition in the vertical change instead of being a sudden step like this broad crested weir and that sharp edge on the front face of it is what accumulates sediment instead of having a, a vertical upstream face the uh, partial flume that we're going to learn a little bit about today has a, uh, a more gradual change in elevation and a gradual choking of the width that induces the critical flow and so here is an isometric view of a partial flume, and you'll notice that the depth is measured in two locations. The water depth is going to be measured in the, uh, as the water approaches the partial flume, it goes through this uh, transition where the channel narrows in the approach, and the water depth is measured, and then there is a vertical change in elevation that helps to induce critical flow, and then in this throat section, the depth is measured again, and then the water exits the partial flume. And so we'll be measuring a partial flume's depth, the depth of flow in two sections, in the converging section and in the throat section. And the, the height of the water in these two locations, location A and location B, is used along with the formula that we have and some nomographs that characterize the energy loss and the flow rate as a function of depth. This is a way of quantifying the flow rate, and you don't lose as much energy through the partial flume as you do at the broad crested weir, and then you also avoid the sedimentation. And so these are used a lot out in uh, farming and ranching uh, applications for measuring the flow rate when uh, someone's trying to irrigate, and they need a really low-tech way of measuring what flow rate is being drawn off of an irrigation canal. Mm -hmm. So are those like compound flooding issues if you try to do it like on a river or something like that? You mean a broad crested weir? Or that? No, I don't think that a partial flume will compound flooding. What What do you mean? So it, it's going to have to choke the flow a little bit uh -huh. to, to get up to the, the right head. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that, if you had a really big storm and a lot of runoff, wouldn't that aim make it easier to flood? Well, it doesn't choke the flow upstream of the weir. I'm sorry, upstream of the flume, it chokes it in the flume itself. And so um, the hope is that it, it doesn't uh, cause any, any sort of disturbance or non-uniformity in any location except for in the, in the zone of the flume itself. Now certainly if there's a lot of flow and you're sending more water through the flume than it's designed for, then yeah, it's definitely going to act as a choke. But if we go to this cross-sectional view, what you'll notice is that um, this drop here, this change of elevation, is enough to help convey the water through the flume without it um, causing non-uniformity upstream. Um, engineers have done a lot of tests over the years, and they've measured what kind of flow rate can get through a flume as a function of how wide the throat is. And so there are these standard throat widths, and there are equations that say, for a certain throat width, what sort of depths are going to be expected based on the flow rate that goes through the flume. And so these are just empirical equations here. There's not really anything fundamental about them. They're just equations that have been built based on observation. And um, you can quantify what the flow rate is by measuring the depth in the converging section. 
you'll notice that all these equations are just using H sub A. Now the reason why we measure the depth of the water in the throat as well is that sometimes if the water depth is too big in the throat, then it can submerge the hydraulic jump that's supposed to form. Inside of the throat, uh, a hydraulic jump will occur. Um, and uh, if, the, if the tail water depth is too high and it submerges that hydraulic jump, then that will reduce the capacity of the flume. And so we'll do a check to see whether or not the hydraulic jump is submerged. And if it is, we have to adjust these equations for the flow rate. And so there's free flow through the flume, and then there is um, a submerged flow, where the hydraulic jump is submerged. And so here's the calculation approach that we'll go through is um, we'll check to see if the downstream depth, H sub B, uh, H sub B, relative to the throat depth, exceeds the submergence criteria. And so for a different throat width, like if the, uh, the throat of the flume is 30 centimeters wide, and if the downstream depth H sub B is more than 70% of the upstream depth in the converging section, then that tells you that it is uh, a submerged hydraulic jump and that some correction factor has to be applied because the submergence of the hydraulic jump is going to slow down how quickly water can get through that flume. And if you do have to apply a correction, then what you'll do is you'll refer to a chart such as this. And uh, you'll look to find what percent submergence you have and the upper head that was measured in the throat, I'm sorry, in the converging section. And then you'll go down and find the uh, correction that has to be applied. And this particular figure is for a throat width of 0.3 meters. And there would be a different figure for any throat width, and uh, partial flume manufacturers have different tables for all of their different uh, partial flumes that they uh, pre-cast, or there can be fiberglass or plastic partial flumes, and a farmer would maybe move a flume from field to field, and they can be made to be very light, set it down into a channel, and then direct the water to go through there, and it, the, the flow rate can be quantified. Um, this is a correction factor if you have a throat width other than 0.3 meters. Like if you didn't have a chart specifically for the width that you're using, if you had uh, a throat width of 0.91 meters, then you can still use this chart, which is 4.3 meters, but then you'd have to apply a multiplier. This correction factor would allow you to use the correction chart from some other throat width. And I'll illustrate that in an example here in a little bit. Um, let's say, for example, that we have a partial flume with a throw width of 0.3 meters. And in the converging section, meaning H sub A, here as the water is starting to, uh, the channel is getting narrower, one third of the way into the converging section, they measure the depth, and the depth there is 45 centimeters. And then in the throat, of the flume, the depth is measured, and the water depth is 39 centimeters. So the question is, is the hydraulic jump submerged? We first have to check to see whether or not any correction factor is required. And for the 0.3 meter throat width, the equation we're going to use here for a 0.3 meter throat width, this is the equation. It's a function of the width of the throat, the depth in the converging section, the width again. This is the base equation that we'd use, and if the jump is submerged, then we have to apply the correction factors as well. Okay, so uh, for this partial flume, we have a uh, width of 0 0.30 meters. H sub A is 0.45 meters, and H B is 0.39. Okay, the first thing to do is check the submergence. And so H B relative to H A, 0.39 to 0.45, well, that is 0.867. And the limit for this, the cutoff point, 
would be 0.7. So we're more than 0.7. The R ratio is above 0.7, and so that means that actually the hydraulic jump is submerged. So 0 0.86 is greater than 0 0.7, so the hydraulic jump is submerged. So correction factor must be applied. So we'll start off using the free flow equation. The free flow equation was this empirical expression 0.372 times W, and our throw width is 0 0.30 meters. And then we have 3.281 times the head A, which was that water depth of 0.45 meters, which was measured. We take that to the 1.570 power times the width, which was 0 0.30 meters. And that's to the 0 0.026 power. That's a really unusual equation for us to have a power of a power. 0 0.30 to the 0.26 power, and this is becoming something else that's a power of another function. So uh, when we go through all of that, this part of it here, this goes to uh, 1.5216. That component is 1.47. 6, 4, 5, and these two terms here, that becomes 0 0.1116. And so all together, the flow rate, Q, is 0 0.201906 cubic meters per second. Being a little optimistic on our precision. That would be the flow rate through the partial flume if the hydraulic jump wasn't submerged. But now what we have to do is we have to apply the correction factor uh, to account for the fact that since the hydraulic jump is submerged, water can't make its way through the flume quite as easily as it otherwise would. And so the correction factor, if we go to the table for our throat width of 0.30, this correction factor we're going to use is 1.0. So we can use this table directly since it's already set up for a width of 0.3 meters. If we have a throat width bigger than 0.3 meters, then we'd have to multiply whatever we found by some correction factor. In our case, we're just going to use the correction factor directly. And so our submergence, our percent submergence was uh, 0.3. 867. So what we'll do is we'll find the curve that corresponds to that. 0.867 is halfway between 86, well, approximately between 86 and 87, closer to 87. So in the middle here somewhere. Now our upper head, H sub A, was 0.45 meters. So to find the value we're going to use as our correction factor, we have to go 0.45. It's going to be up over here, and then over to 87, and then down, and so our correction is 0 0.03. And so this is the free flow, flow rate, and the Q um, submerged since our hydro hydraulic jump is submerged, would be the 0 0.202 cubic meters per second minus 0 0.03, which was our correction factor. And so the actual flow rate through that flume is going to be 0 0.172 cubic meters per second. 172 liters per second is how much is going to go through that flume. Just to put it in some sense that maybe you'd be more acquainted with, this is about a one foot wide flume. The throat is approximately one foot wide. And so to get 172 cubic, uh, 
172 liters per second through there. The water is really moving at a pretty uh, high rate through that partial plume. You can get a big capacity for uh, a relatively small channel width. I'm going to be sending you a link to a video. We ran out of time today because we, uh, we focused on the spreadsheets for a while. So it's just a three or four minute YouTube video that talks more about partial plumes. I'll send that to you because I'd just like you to understand more about it as a uh, hydraulic structure. You've seen now the calculations and the homework that I've handed out to you today. Uh, this last homework assignment has a partial plume problem in it. So uh, we may revisit that a little bit more on Monday. See you on Monday.